Well, welcome to one and all. We are here in Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, and we're picking up with with chapter two. And big picture wise, it, it's important to remember. I just want to do this. It is important to remember that this this letter has a context. It has a context. I cranked my volume up earlier, and that's why it's so loud in my ear. Paul was on his second missionary journey. As he writes this letter, as we'll see today, he was still on his second missionary journey. He had come up through here where he'd gone on his first missionary journey and come all the way over here, and up here is Thessalonica. And he made his way. He had to leave, went on to Berea. When he writes this letter, and we should get to this in the text today, he's down in Athens. He's down in Athens when he writes this letter. So there has not been a lot of time that has passed since he was there with them. But it is important to remember that these are real people with real lives. Just, <laughs> I got curious this morning. Let's see if I can find it here without, uh, yeah. So <laughs> these are some of the ocean views from Thessalonica. <laughs> and I was thinking of that because I uh, got a message sent to me this morning, somebody on the beach down in Florida, but the Aegean Sea is just gorgeous. It's a, it's a beautiful place. And these were real people with real lives, with real stuff going on, who lived there, to whom Paul was writing, to whom he was addressing this letter. And it's important to remind ourselves of that. You know, we're reading this correspondence that was penned 2,000 years ago, and it can seem more of a historical document. But if you read it that way, if you view it as a historical document, you just miss so much. And in this section, the big takeaway is Paul's concern for these people. Remember what happened when he was there. He got driven out of town. There was a big blow up. Go back and remind yourself of what went on. Go back and read Acts 17, 1 through 10. There was a big blow up. They arrested Jason. Paul had to leave. Couldn't stay there. He's concerned for them. Because do you think things got better for them after he left? They would have gotten worse had he stayed because he was such a focal point. He was known around the Roman world, okay? Christianity was known around the Roman world. You'll see that in that section I referenced, Acts 17, 1 through 10, where they say they've stirred up the whole world with this teaching. But had he stayed, it would have gotten worse. He left. That didn't mean it got better. And they didn't, we take so many things for granted. We take so many things for granted. You know, when I was a missionary in Peru, I could send messages, email to the young pastors who were under my charge, who I assisted up in the mountains, way up in the Andes. They had email. They'd go to an internet cabina and cafe, internet cafe, and and, and check their email messages. And, and at the time, that was real avant-garde. Like, ooh, wow, we can, we can do email with these people way up in the mountains. But they had none of this. How do you think this letter got to the Christians in Thessalonica? Well, Paul paid someone to take it to them. There wasn't a regular postal service as we think of it. You wrote a letter and you sent it to them. And you wouldn't know that it got there, kind of like the U.S. Postal Service <laughs> today. You send something and you're not sure it got there. Um, so there was just this distance 
involved. When you were gone, you were gone. You know, now we text, instant message all the time. I've got family all over the place. We're in touch all the time. We've got a family group chat. We're sharing pictures. We're doing all, there was none of that. There was none of that. So Paul was concerned. And if, and, and this is the best way to think of it, if you are a parent, and your children are somewhere where you know it's a bad place, you know there's all kinds of peril and danger there, where is your mind going to go? You're going to be concerned. Even if you're being faithful and trusting God and, and all of that, your mind is going to keep going, wow, this could be going on. This could be happening. And that is the context for what we're reading here today. Paul's longing to see them again, verse 17. But since we were, come on, quit that. Since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time, in person, not in heart, we endeavored to see more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face because we wanted to come to you. And I, Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown or boasting before the Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? For you are our glory and our joy. Paul didn't ever just use flowery speech. You and I do, right? In in different situations, you're trying to butter somebody up. You're trying to score points, whatever, we can, we can just use verbiage because it sounds nice. All of this verbiage was inspired by the Holy Spirit, and you can tell there is passion in this. Paul is pouring out his heart to these people, and he says, but since we were torn away from you, do you know what that word for torn away is? And, and what it is in the Greek is of little, com- little consequence to us. It's aporfanizo. <laughs> it means to be orphaned. It, uh, fun, it's orphano, orphanizo, orphan, orphan. It's where the word orphan comes from. An orphan is the core root of that meaning is it's someone who's estranged from those who should care for them, right? And that's how orphans feel, right? They feel abandoned. They spend their whole lives wondering who their real parents are and why they were abandoned. Well, in this context, Paul is saying, basically, my children were stripped away from me. That's how he feels. That's that's the mindset that in the emotional state that he has about this. But since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time, in person, not in heart, they, they made us leave. Physically, I had to be absent from you, but my heart never left, is what he's saying. We endeavored. We, we, it was an and endeavor. Endeavor. I always think of uh, um, Clint Eastwood and the outlaw Josie Wales and Chief Dan George saying that they told the Indians to endeavor to persevere. Endeavor isn't, isn't that powerful of a word. This is more struggle is is the sense of it. We endeavored the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face. This is what he wants. He wants to be able to see them and know that they're okay because we wanted to come to you. We wanted to come to you, the plural, and he's there with Silas and Timothy, right? But he goes immediately to the personal. I, Paul, again and again, wanted to get to them, wanted to get back to them because they had received the gospel, right, in the midst of all kinds of affliction and persecution and all that stuff going on. It it might be the most enthusiastic reception to the gospel that Paul had received to this point in time, right? I wanted to come to you, I, Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. Again, Paul doesn't use any throwaway lines. This is not hyperbole. Paul understood 
Paul understood that there was a spiritual struggle afoot. Now, when the powers that be in a given place, in Thessalonica, in Paul's time, or here in these United States or other places in the world, it might be things are done that are political. They're by political actors, players on the political stage. They don't seem to be spiritual. Satan uses those people. And Paul understood that full well. If you're not the Lord's, if you're not with him, well, who are you with? It's it's Satan. Satan is active. He, he's always on the go, and he is an adversary. At the end of this day, whatever time it is when you're listening to this, when you're watching this video, might be in the evening. In a couple hours, you're going to go to bed. You're going to have had enough, and you know you got a long day tomorrow, and you got to get some rest. Satan doesn't rest. He doesn't need to. He's always on the go, and he's passionate with a fervor. He is a roaring lion seeking whom he might devour. And Paul understood that. Satan hindered us. He doesn't tell us how that is, that Satan hindered him from being able to go back. But that's what he says is going on. That was his understanding of it. So with that as well, as much as we see God's super abundant grace in the early church with it having success with this, this small little collection of nobodies, and, and Paul wasn't a nobody. Paul was a somebody who became a nobody because he left the club, right? He, he was an outcast. He was an oddball. And, but through them, the Lord Jesus accomplished great things. He poured out his Holy Spirit and, and blessed their work. And we can think about it as, you know, those were the good old days, right? Oh, that I could be a believer in the time of Paul. And we actually think nonsense like that. Now, from an understanding perspective, would I love to see it, be able to like be in a time bubble and go back and see things and have deeper understanding? Yeah. But if you think that these were the good old days, you're deceiving yourself. You're deceiving yourself. My first day in seminary, way, way, way back, long, long ago, there were dinosaurs out the window. You could see them. My first day in seminary, the, the professor I had for church history, we were getting ready to study church history, and we were starting right at the end of the apostolic era, okay? And he had the half glasses down over his nose, and he had this great big mustache, kind of like the walrus mustache, you know? And he looked over his glasses, and he, his eyes would kind of partly close, and he said, gentlemen, the apostolic era was not the good old days. And he went through all the epics of Christian history that these were not the good old days. There are no good old days. Paul would definitely have not described his time as the good old days. Satan was a ravenous beast trying to kill the church while it was young. Paul suffered affliction all the time, physical abuse, I think I live in difficult times. And, and hey, a as I do this video, it's the weekend, it's a Sunday, it's August 1st, and it's all coming out that they're going to vaccine these mandates, <laughs> mandate these vaccines, vaccine these mandates. That's what they need to do. They need to give that death suit to the mandates themse it's themselves. But Walmart, Google, Apple, all, all the big companies are advancing. It was just happened that it was Biden saying the Veterans Administration had to have it. And let me ask this. I'm just, side point, I can't help it. If the doctors know this stuff is so good for you, if the nurses know this stuff is so good for you, then why do they have to force them to take it? Enough of that side point. But we think we live in difficult times. I've never been beaten with rods. I've never been flogged. I've never been thrown into jail and locked up in the stocks. I haven't had the other people working beside me get their heads cut off. I haven't had any of that stuff. So there are no good old days, right? 
We live, we endeavor to live faithfully in the times where the Lord has us. You know why? Because he wants you here. He wants you here. Now you can think, oh, wow, why do we have to? He wants you here. If he didn't want you here, you wouldn't be here. He'd have you in another period of time, another period of history. It is not for me to question where I serve the Lord, when I serve the Lord. It's only of me to endeavor, to strive with the Lord's help to be faithful as I serve the Lord. So basically, stop whining. I'm saying this to me. I'm not saying it to you. Stop whining. Pray to God for strength. Pray to God for wisdom. And let him lead you. Just be faithful. And don't take that shot. It's death soup. I've got a series of videos on that. You can go on my channel to vaccine videos. I got a playlist on BitChute, vaccine videos. Okay, Satan hindered us. He never stops, and he doesn't care what he uses. He'll use local governments. He'll use religious leaders. He'll use leaders within the church. He doesn't care. He's got his claws everywhere. For what is our hope, our joy, our crown of boasting? That's pretty lofty talk. Hope, joy, crown of boasting. Paul isn't worried about him. His goal isn't about him. He knows he's going to remain faithful unto death and receive that crown of life, right? At the end, when he's locked in a prison cell in a dungeon in 2 Timothy, he talks about being poured out like a drink offering and the time of his departure is at hand. But there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me, and not only to me, but all those who have longed for his appearing. He wants that for these Christians in Thessalonica. They are his hope, his joy, his crown of boasting. When I appear before the Lord, he's going to look at me and say, what'd you do? What'd you do? I gave you, I gave you three talents. What did you do with it? Well, I hid in my house and bought lots of ammunition and stored up food to be ready for the end times. <laughs> and he'd say, you did nothing. You did nothing. Share the word. Preach. Proclaim. Paul understood that all the good stuff that Jesus would say about him was about them in Thessalonica, in Philippi, in Lystra, in Derb, in Ephesus, in Berea. That's what he was about. Perspective. What's your perspective? What matters to you? If the stuff of this world matters to you, then be afraid. Be afraid because they can take it and they will. That is their plan. Now, will their plans come to fruition? I don't know. It's looking pretty daggone ominous right now. But if you love the stuff of this world, they've got power over you because they can take it. Satan knows he owns this world. All these people with this crazy, maniacal drive to destruction, he owns them. They work for him, and they can take the stuff of this world away from me. But they can't take Jesus away from me, and they can't take me away from him. I am the apple of his eye, and he holds me in his hand, and they can't have me. And that's what Paul knew. And that's why he never shut up. And that's why he never stopped. From the cell, can you imagine how lousy a dungeon the Romans could throw you in if they wanted to? From there, he was writing a letter. Second Timothy, go read it. He was writing a letter to the young pastor, Timothy, who was just one of the guys who would continue on with the work after he was gone. He didn't stop. He didn't stop because he understood that all of those people to whom he ministered were his hope, his joy, his crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming. For Paul, everything had an eschatological trajectory. There, that's our big phrase for the day. If I were Mr. Rogers, I'd ask if you can say that, eschatological trajectory. But it's an important phrase. It's all about where we're going. It's all about where they're going. 
eschatology, the end times, the end, judgment day, that, that great and terrible day. It's a great day for us. I can't wait. I can't wait. I've always thought that if I actually get to be there here in this world, when it comes to see that lightning from east to west, the trumpet call of God and Jesus returning on the clouds, the cloud rider, the son of man in the clouds, Daniel 7, returning. For me, that's a great day. I can't wait because he's going to look at me and he's going to look at you and say, they're with me. And that's it. No accounting. No judgment. For us, it's a great day. For others, it's a terrible day. And they will answer. In this world, in this world, very often, they don't answer for their sins. They don't answer for their wickedness. In this world, they're rewarded for it. Why? Because the prince of this world is currently in charge of the things of this world, and he gives great rewards. You know, everybody thinks, oh, it's all about the money, these vaccines, all this evil stuff. It's all about the money. Money is just the carrot. Money are the cookies that Satan gives away to get people to go where he goes. But eventually, it's not about the money, and it's not about, it's about the power. It's about the power. But Jesus is coming back, and there will be judgment, and I can't forget that. I don't expect to see justice in this world. I don't expect it. I don't, it, whether it happens or not, doesn't impact me in a big, big way because there is true justice. There's nothing this world that can mete out is justice for the people who murder millions. Let's talk abortion. Who, who slaughter millions. Let's talk Mao Zedong and, and Stalin. There's no justice here for that. That's later. Mao Zedong, he, he, he's getting his just reward, right? Because he's gone. He's not here. Before our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming, is it not you? For you are our glory and joy. On the last day, Paul's going to look around and see all these people. And, and he's just going to be thrilled that he had a part and them coming to faith, them being ministered to, them being strengthened. That's what he's thinking. So, and I want to make a note here that the first three chapters of this book, and I'd never really seen this before. You know, you get looking at things, you're looking verse by verse, and you're analyzing, and you're looking at how things are phrased and how they're worded and, and what the doctrinal points are. But if you just back up, and I did it this morning, if you just back up and read this letter, what's he saying? What's he doing? Pretend you haven't read it before, and, and you're not getting caught up on the specific doctrinal points. The first three chapters of this letter are all about, hey, I love you. I had to leave, and I'm worried about this and this and this, and that you think I don't care, and that you think we could have come back and we didn't because we like the Christians in Berea more, or all these different things. And he's setting the record straight, and he's pouring out his heart to them so they understand, and he's covering a multitude of possibilities of all the different things they might have thought and making sure they understand, I didn't want to leave you. Not that way. I didn't want to leave you. I wanted to come back and I couldn't. Why? Why is he going through all this three chapters of it? And he's teaching them things along the way. Don't get me wrong. It's not all. He's always doing many things at once. But he wants to make sure they know this is where you fit in. This is how much you matter. This is what you mean to me. And we'll continue to see it through chapter three. Therefore, when we could bear it no longer, we were willing to be left behind at Athens alone. And we sent Timothy, our brother and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ, to establish and exhort you in your faith. There's that young man, Timothy. The young guy, Timothy, the pastor to whom two letters were written. We're going to go and take a look at the map just so maps make things real. So they're down here in Athens, way down here. And you see, if I back this out, 
you will see where to go. There's the scale. So this right here is 200 miles there at the top. So Timothy went all the way back up. Paul and Silas stayed in Athens, and Timothy went all the way back up to Thessalonica to be with them, to, to minister to them, because if Paul showed up in town again, everybody knows who he is. They've seen him before. But Timothy, he was a side player. He sent him back. To what To do what? To establish and to exhort you in your faith. Establish. We need, you need to grow in the grace and knowledge of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Think of it as roots. Right outside my house, we've got this great big oak tree. And when the wind blows, oh my goodness, think of when a, a 50 mile an hour gust comes through, think of the amount of force exerted on that, exerted, exerted, <laughs> that's what it says in the text, exerted on that tree, the physics involved with that. Well, the tree, that great big oak tree has a network of roots under the ground as big as the tree. When you look at a tree, and it might not be the, the same shape, but the network is just as big. When you look at a tree, imagine that much under the ground spreading out all over the place. That's why that great big oak tree, it might lose a branch. It'll lose leaves. And in the fall, it loses a ton of acorns all over my driveway. Um, but it's not going to fall over. Okay. We need to be established. That tree is established. It's not going to get blown over, right? I need to be established. My roots, my understanding, where I get my strength, my nourishment, think of roots, needs to be sunk down into the Word of God, His teaching. That's why I do what I do. You can go out on our, our YouTube channel. I'm going to, have my, I'm going to have the website up soon, and everything will be available there and more. But it uh, <laughs> sounds like... You get all these things and more on the website. Um, but you can go out. We've got playlists on Exodus, the entire book of Exodus, Joshua, Revelation, Matthew, and First Thessalonians. And we're just going to keep going. Got all these resources out there. We want to help people be established in Jesus Christ to, to put our roots down deep, because if my roots go down deep, they're not going to blow me over. They might break off some branches, but they're not going to blow me over. And exhort, to establish and exhort. Sometimes we need a gentle nudge. Sometimes we need a gentle kick in the behind to get us moving in the right way. Sometimes we need someone to call us out. Think of the people in your life of faith who mean the most to you, those to whom you look up the most, those who you think of as being truly exemplary in how they live their faith. When I think of that, part of what th those people mean to me is they will call me out on things, that they will correct me lovingly, gently, but forcefully when I need to be corrected. Because, man, I am stubborn. I am stubborn. And, and the people out there who know me personally, they're chuckling right now because I am stubborn. I get something in my mind and I'll keep going. I'll stick with it for the longest time. And if you're going to exhort me, you got to get my attention. Well, exhorting contains all of that. To exhort you in your faith that no one be moved by these afflictions, for you yourselves know that we are destined for this. Woo! Don't be moved by the afflictions. Jesus, John 16, 33. Memorize it. These things are good. Just file them away. File them away. John 16, 33. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. There's going to be trouble, but we don't want to be moved 
by these afflictions. We want to allow the afflictions and what we go through to strengthen us. Because guess what? When I'm persecuted, when I'm struggling, when I'm having a hard time, I'm going to run to Jesus. And when I run to Jesus, I get the strength that I need. And where do I run to Jesus? In his word. For you yourselves know that we are destined for this. This stuff's going to go on. King Solomon, there's nothing new under the sun. What has been before will happen again. It's just going to keep going. It will get worse, and you need to be ready for that. Don't let it scare you. Let it galvanize you. Let it motivate you to action and do the work. Do the work of a believer. Pray. Study. Study and pray at the same time. You know, I, faith life and, and, and devotion time, time in the word, whatever. It's like, okay, I'm going to pray and then I'm going to read the word. Well, maybe do both. Read some of the word. It gets you thinking about something. Pray about it. Pray that God will give you insight and understanding and read some, pray some, think some. Let it be a dynamic process. It is really, it is a conversation with, with your God. For when we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction just as it has come to pass. And just as you know, there's going to be trouble. It's going to happen. They saw it in what happened to Paul. We talked about that in the first chapter. I sent to learn about your faith for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you and our labor would be in vain. Temptation is going to come. Satan, you say whatever you want. He's a lot smarter than we are. He's a lot smarter than we are. Have you ever you know, played a game? There's a, there's a card game that that we play at our house and and it was the, my wife's side of the family they played this thing all the time canasta and and they just they just do it they just see everything they it's kind of a complex complex game they've been doing it forever they're really really good at it right why because they've been playing it for decades I've been playing it for a few years, and I always get my clock cleaned. But that's okay. It's it's a fun game. Satan's been at this tempting thing since the beginning. He got Adam and Eve to fall for his lies, and he's only gotten better since. He can package his lies, his deception, the temptation, so many different ways. You know, it's like you can see all the books behind me. It's just part of my books, but... All, all the books behind me, think of those as like binders on how to do different things, right? Protocols for how to how to tempt these people, how to tempt those people. How big is Satan's shelf? He, he's got all kinds of things to pull off. So we need to be wary of him for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted the, you and our labor would be in vain. We don't want to underestimate Satan and what he can do and what he will do. Okay. So, Paul, get our map back up here. Paul had sent Timothy from Athens all the way back up to Thessalonica, and now he's saying Timothy had come back to them. Why? Because... Well, he couldn't email or text or FaceTime. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us the good news of your faith and love and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you, for this reason, brothers, in all our distress and affliction, we have been comforted about you through your faith. Okay. Okay. Now, interestingly, and I don't know if I've mentioned this before, Paul does get to see the Christians in Thessalonica again. He passes through there when he's on his third missionary journey. He's on his second missionary journey. Now, on his third missionary journey, 
it doesn't really tell us anything about his time in in Thessalonica because when Luke records the book of Acts and he writes those things down, it, it's not a, a travelogue. It's not a diary of everything they did. It, it rather is giving highlights that teach us the things the Holy Spirit wanted us to know. But Timothy had come all the way back down to Athens again, and he had good news. Paul's fears that they might have thought he didn't care and all of that wasn't the case. They remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you. So the affection that was there was was mutual. For this reason, brothers, in all our distress and affliction, we have been comforted about you through your faith. The social component of faithfulness is something that that we sell short very often. And by that, I mean this. When you are faithful, when you stand up under affliction, when you deal faithfully with hard times, with loss, with suffering, with disease, whatever it might be, when you live that and go through that and do so faithfully, it has an effect on other people. It strengthens other people. It encourages other people. It it shines a light on a path of how do you walk this difficult road? Well, here's how you do it. Look at this person. You know them. How did they deal with that? You know, did they fall apart and think that God didn't love them because they got a horrible prognosis for their health? No. Yeah. Were they shaken by it? Yeah. Did they remain faithful and trust that God was taking care of them no matter what and and move ahead? Yeah. Yeah, and, and that can I, I could use examples from all kinds of different scenarios that we encounter, but your faithfulness is a blessing to other people, and we don't think of it that way. But Paul is making it very clear here that the faithfulness of the Christians in Thessalonica had an impact on him. It strengthened him. It encouraged him. So remember, it's not always about you. It, it very often is about a bigger community. And to whatever degree you are in a position of leadership, to whatever degree people look up to you. And you know why different people, why, why do we look up to different people? Because they're leaders. You know what makes a leader? They lead. (laughs) That really is it. Who does everyone look to when things go bad? They look to the person who they know is going to give good guidance, know what to do, right? To whatever degree you're in a leadership position, it's all the more important that you understand that you realize how you react to things is an example to everybody else. And that should be, I'm in a position where people look at me as a leader, a teacher, a pastor, a preacher, whatever. It's important that I understand that, that, that how I react to things, how I deal with things, how I walk my faith, how I do that journey, that hand-to-hand journey with Jesus through life has an impact on other people because we are we are social beings. We desire to be in community. It's part of God's structure. What is a family? What is marriage? It's community. What is family? It's community. What are friends? That's community. What is church? That's that's community. So how we live has an impact, positive or negative, on other people here. It was a positive impact that this had on Paul, that the Christians in Thessalonica were being faithful. For now we live, if you are standing fast in the Lord, that's how much it means to him. It's like, wow, everything's good. 
we're okay. Pretty powerful statement. For now we live if you were standing fast in the Lord. They were vitally important to him. For what thanksgiving can we return to God for you? For all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God as we pray most earnestly night and day that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. Gratitude. Be thankful for the people in your life. Thank God for them. When you go to pray for whoever it might be, your spouse, your kids, your friends, your siblings, your parents, start with gratitude. Start with gratitude. Be thankful for them. And Paul just models that. He tells us, give thanks in all circumstances, all kinds of different places in his letters. But he didn't just tell us that. He he lived it. it. It comes through in the conversation that he has with these people. They matter to him. He's thankful for them. Be thankful for the people in your life. Be thankful for the example they set, the strength they give, the guidance and support that they give. Be thankful that you get to be those things to them. And then pray to God to give you the ability to be the things for those people that you should be for those people. Perspective. How do I view things? How do I think about things? I definitely want that to come into my prayer life and how I'm talking with my Lord. Now, may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, as we do for you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Again, it's just there. It's there, that that vision is like Paul constantly, this is a good way to think about it, you know, the, the term eschatological trajectory, it, it sounds nice and it, it brings a lot of things to mind, but let's think of it this way. In Paul's mind, as he looked around, he always saw a line tracing to the last day. The Whatever the path was going to be, was going to be shaped and guided by that. Is this activity, is this decision, is this expenditure of funds and resources, is that moving us along, not just me and Silas and Timothy or Barnabas or or whoever else, Titus might have been with him at the time. He had a, a, a cast of supporting people around him that varied from time to time, Luke, as to who it was. Are these decisions moving us toward that goal, following that line, or are they not? That's a pretty good way to think about things. Is what I'm doing, is how I'm using my resources, the gifts that I have, is that advancing the cause of the gospel and the gospel is all about people being saved there on that last day before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. And he's going to get to that picture in chapter four of us all being together with the Lord. Awesome stuff. Okay. And may the Lord make you, cause you to increase and abound in love. Love. It's not about me. It's about other people. Agape, that word that gets thrown around all the time, it is the kind of love that God has for us. It is selfless love. It is about being more concerned, our focus being on the well-being, the welfare, the happiness of others. If, If that is a driving force in my life, if that is increasing and 
abounding in me, then I'm going to probably, I'm just guessing, I'm probably going to be a whole lot better person in Jesus' eyes. Because again, what is our goal? What is our goal? Christ is being formed in us as we are established, as we sink our roots down into his word, as our, as our life of faith evolves and grows and, and our conversation with him in prayer grows. As that goes on, I'm being made to be more like him. I want to be like Jesus. That's, what's, that's what all of this is about. And so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father. Blameless in holiness. In holiness, I am blameless. Now, that doesn't mean I'm without sin. Don't, don't get that wrong. But it's talking about faithfulness. Faithfulness, that that defines our relationship with God. So we are going to stop there. It's a little bit early, but I'm not going to jump into chapter four today because I want to do that all together. So we are going to stop there. I hope that this time was a blessing to you. I encourage you, if you like it, please give us a thumbs up. It does matter as far as this message being put out in front of other people. I encourage you to subscribe. And if you subscribe, make sure and hit that notification bell so that you're made aware when we put out new new videos. And finally, please share this video with someone else. God bless and have a great day. That concludes our broadcast for today. We publish our videos on YouTube, BitChute, and Brideon. We hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, please give us a like or a thumbs up. We invite you to subscribe so you can continue to receive our content. Also, please consider sharing this video with others. We love to hear from you, so please leave a comment below. This is Matthias 76, and together we will continue to decode the deception.